Good morning, my friends and family from the APC Age. My name is Helena Jilks, and I am a member of the APC Age since the 80s, 1980. I would like to give you this this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God created mankind and the earth, so we owe him the utmost gratitude. Friends and family, I have been missing you, and I hope to see you soon in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Enjoy the service, and have a blessed Sunday and also a blessed week. Bye. Hi, this is uh, Ardika and Raina van Wijnen. And um, we are bringing our greetings from the garden where we're sharing some valued, valuable time. And we miss you all immensely and hope that you're all doing very well. I miss you very much and we wish you the best in everything that I can think of. And I hope to go as soon as I can back to the church. Back to the church. Good morning and welcome to this virtual worship service on this, the last Sunday of June. Sixteen weeks ago was my very first Sunday at APCH and we were here, gathered for worship, singing together, listening to the word preached, the youth group met, the Sunday school met, we were all together. And a week later, that all changed. But next Sunday, for those who are able and feel comfortable gathering in large groups, we will worship again at APCH at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Guidelines have been sent out. We'll wear masks. We'll maintain social distancing. Sadly, we won't sing, but we'll be together and we'll worship God. For those of you who are new to APCH since our online services began, if you live in the area, of course, please do join us if you are able to. Like everybody else, we are asking that you sign up online or call the church office to let the team know that you will join us, but no one will be turned away who comes without registering. There's a place for you here. Now, sadly, next week, for reasons of safety and health, we won't celebrate the Lord's Supper as we usually do on the first Sunday of the month. But Pastor Mark will address this later in his message today. Hear these words as we are called to worship. Let us worship the eternal God, the source of love and life who creates us. Let us worship Jesus Christ, the risen one, who lives among us. Let us worship the Spirit, the holy fire who renews us. To the one true God be praise in all times and all places through the grace of Jesus Christ. And it is that Jesus Christ who is at the heart of our worship. Sometimes we make it more about ourselves, our own preferences, our desires, but Jesus is the center. Jesus is the king. Jesus is the host, the one who gathers us to worship and adore him. So let's do that now together. No 
Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from selected passages from Genesis 2 and 3. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, 
but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Greetings, APCH community and those far from it. It's a joy to be with you as always. Let's pray together. God, our creator and savior, even as you spoke to our ancient ancestors, Adam and Eve, and all your people throughout time, so speak today to us. Transform our lives to your glory, to our joy and to the blessing of the world all around. In your name we pray, amen. Things are opening up in the region. The COVID pandemic continues to have a terrible effect on so much of the world and society. There are elements of health, of course. The environment has shown signs of beauty and life that we haven't seen for a long time. And many people around have found time to reevaluate their callings or to establish new senses of balance in life. Some have even found faith during this time. But the pandemic has had terrible effects upon so many. Sickness and death from the illness that continues to increase in many parts of the world. Economies have been threatened. People have lost jobs. Many are without adequate food, shelter, health care. And even in the most prepared places, the disease causes many to be filled with concern, even fear. But biblically speaking, there was long ago an infinitely greater assault on human beings and on the whole world. The rebellion of our first ancestors, Adam and Eve, against God, shattered the beauty of God's beautiful creation. That rebellion was, biblically speaking, the source of all unspeakable evils and sufferings terrible hostilities between people and nations, inhumane work conditions for so many, physical pain and disease, suffering, even the COVID crisis, global catastrophes, and so much more. The rebellion of Adam and Eve was the radical act that caused sin and evil, hate and death to thrive among us. Its effects have been infinitely more catastrophic than this global pandemic. 
as terrible as it is. And it all had to do with a tree. In the Genesis 2 story, God created man, in the Hebrew, Adam, from the dust of the ground, in the Hebrew, Adama. Like the Ash Wednesday refrain goes, for you and me, remember that you are dust, and to dust you will return. It would have helped Adam and Eve to remember that as well. And then God plants a garden, filling it with trees that are beautiful to look at and good for food. You know many of those. You've been thinking of them over the last few weeks and seeing them. And God put Adam in that garden to work it and care for it. And in the middle of the garden were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God pointed to the garden all around him and said to Adam, Adam, all these trees are yours. You're free to eat from any of the fruit in the garden. But this, you are not to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. It's one of the most famous trees in the Bible, but it's only mentioned two times there, both instances in this chapter, in this story. The other tree, the, the tree of life, we'll take a look at in a future message this summer later on the trees of the Bible. God planted those trees, the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the center of the garden, essentially communicating to Adam that this gift and calling of God related to those two trees are to be the center of his life. That is, God is giving life, and so Adam and Eve later might well remember this gift of life and take from the tree that they ignored but also, Adam needs to remember the limits of human beings, that we're created to live within the guiding word of God the Creator, to know how to live well, not just for ourselves, but for everyone and for the sake of the world all around us. Exactly what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil itself represents has been debated over and over again throughout history. But at least this, it's something related to God's command. For one created in God's image, to take and eat of that tree would be to live against God's command on one's own authority with a moral autonomy that would be like one trying, well, you could say, to be one's own God. Perhaps, by the way, that's why this Fruit has traditionally been called an apple. In Latin, the word for evil, for all that would come forth from eating of this fruit, in Latin, the word for evil is malus, and the word for apple is malum. Close enough, people figured, for evil was the promise of disobedience, and that fruit was the focus. Then finally, at the end of chapter 2, God blesses Adam with Eve, and the two delight in each other and in God's garden and in their creator. But now, in chapter 3, enter the serpent, a creature that God had made. But the serpent, it soon becomes clear, that is working for the other side, for the rebellion. I have a, a rattlesnake that I cut off from a Southern California rattler by our house. That snake's rattle is frightening if you're near it. Just the sound of it stops you in your tracks and you want to run away. I doubt very much that that serpent was anything like that rattler. Quite the contrary. We're intended to imagine, I think, a beautiful, fascinating reptile. 
And if the serpent spoke, he wouldn't have spoken in a demonic growl, did God say to you? But in an attractive, gentle, wise-sounding tone. And a thoughtful conversation begins. God is not in the picture, though, and Eve doesn't seem to notice or care. You may know what that's like even as I do. Many of you know the story. The serpent asks, twisting the truth a bit to start, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Because if God would do that, that would be so cruel. Oh no, that's not what God said, replied Eve. We may eat from the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, she added, or you will die. She was correct at first, of course, but she brings an element of strictness into it that has God looking darker than God is. Honestly, I can imagine that Adam and Eve both perhaps said, let's not even go near and touch it. But that was not God's word. And the serpent responds, ha, you will surely not die. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. You know that about temptation. It says, God isn't the whole issue here. There's more. You'll miss out if you don't take it in. So when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was much like the other fruits of the garden, good for food and pleasing to look at, and that, in addition, it was very desirable. You could gain wisdom from it, she was told. She took and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Desire. That's both the great gift of God. It has us growing toward beautiful accomplishments and shaping important groups and businesses. It has us disciplining our lives in order to accomplish something important. But desire, when separated from the will and the calling of God, when done apart from love for others and love for our Creator and Redeemer, Desire can destroy and ruin you and many around you. And Eve desires, and she takes and eats, just like we take and eat. Or we suddenly see and buy, or feel and give in, or notice, every, notice that everybody else is doing it and join in, or hear the voice of God but find that it's harder than we want to live, and so we ignore it. But why, when you have a garden of delights like Adam and Eve, do you want more? And why, when God our Creator and good, good Father speaks a living word, do we so easily close our ears? Uh, because there was within Adam and Eve, too, the the seed unopened of self-centeredness and rebellion that was dormant in their lives. But God, by his grace and creative goodness, allowed that to be there. And when they took and they ate against God's will, that seed exploded and grew in the very fiber of their being, causing them to pass down to their posterity the same natural desire to rebel against God. Uh, we're sinners, as it is said, not just by nurture, but fundamentally by nature. The gift of God was to create us with remarkable abilities, with wonderful intellect, with loving affections, with beautiful desires. God made us, God says in the Psalms, little less than the heavenly beings. Yet we want more, we think. God must not be fully trustworthy. And Eve took and ate, and we take and eat. 
And she gave some to Adam, and he took and ate. And we share with others, too, when we take and eat and offer and model and receive those gifts or devastating sins from others. Ah, you know it well, this inherited natural tendency. Temptation engages us. We forget about God. We choose our own way. We rebel. It comes to us in different ways, of course. But we all know it. Sometimes it comes without warning, catching us off guard. We have a friend who was addicted to crack cocaine. I wish I could tell you the whole story of how she got there, but it was destroying her life and, with her life, her three young sons. By the grace of God and through the love of the church, Tiffany came to know Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. She and her sons joined the church and were delightful parts of the ministry. Personally, socially, financially, life was being blessed for them. You might say that compared to the life she had experienced before, she was living in paradise. For two years, it was so. Her oldest son was becoming a teenager, 13. And to celebrate, Tiffany had been saving dimes and nickels for a year to take him to a wonderful store to buy him whatever he wanted for $50. She told him so a week before his birthday, and he was filled with excitement. The night before his special day, he and his brothers went to bed with joy in their hearts and toys on their minds. But that night, the tempter came in in the form of her cousin. He related to her well, and they laughed at the stories of their youth and their growing up years together. And then at one point, her cousin reached in his pocket, pulled out a little plastic bag, and dropped it on the table. It was crack cocaine. And in a moment, she was taken by it. She got the money from upstairs that she had been saving for her son. She paid for the cocaine, heated it up, smoked it. And in the morning, her 13-year-old son found her on the floor, passed out. He helped her get to her bed. And that was the end of the day. And that was the end of a good life. The truth be told, you might blame Tiffany but she was infected by a disease that you and I are blamed with too, whether a disease of addictions or a disease of spiritual judgment or whether a disease of all sorts in our lives. And without thinking, she fell even as you and I take and eat. For others, the temptation to sin comes as we get worn down by the enticement or the voices or the situation that calls us. Sometimes we're like a frog in a kettle when it comes to temptation and sin. We never intended to be so owned by that habit, so controlled by money, so proud and judgmental. But over time we were conquered and now we don't even recognize that we live in it. Some of us are content to live like we do whether or not God's intention is for us. We're satisfied and don't really want to be too intentional about following Jesus in the way that he calls us to, to bless the whole world. In one way or other, we are all infected. In one way or other, we all take and eat too. Every sin, small and great, tragic and subtle, spiritual and earthy, every sin is garden variety. And the result of Adam and Eve taking and eating was devastating. Relationships were and now are divided. We try to rule over other people, even as Adam would start to rule over Eve. Pain and suffering came upon us. Work became a drudgery, a disappointment, even a loss sometimes. The whole creation began to be groaning in pain with catastrophes. 
and we were driven from the garden. The rest of the story of the Bible, though, would be of God's persistent, faithful, painful, gracious love and care for his people and world. What began in the garden would be continued through the children of Abraham and the stories of the people of Israel. They too would keep taking and eating. We would keep ignoring God's voice, not trusting his word, not living to declare his glory and goodness to the nations until God would restore us himself by his grace and wonder and power. He would send his own son, Jesus, to be the new Adam. And at the beginning of ministry, Jesus himself would face terrible temptations by the devil himself. Yet he would remember the word of God. He would trust in the Father's care, and he would deny Satan that power. He would resist and live faithfully on our behalf, for us. He would live to God's glory. Christ, the new Adam, would live the life that God gave him through suffering and blessings, grounded in God's word and prayer, and living it out boldly, beautifully, by the Father's call and nourishing spirit within him, until he would be put to death, because of his beauty and goodness that even good religious people couldn't stand. And as the New Testament says, it was no ordinary death. He himself was put to death on a tree, too. It was a tree that when people saw him on that cross made of wood, people knew he was cursed. What they didn't understand then But praise to God we do now is that he was cursed for us and for our salvation and for the forgiveness of the sins of all by his resurrection, life, and immortal reign. He says to you and all who believe, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God your Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit who is among and within you. And he says, come. Follow me, learn of my ways, grow in the fullness of my spirit. And by his grace and power, we live in a new life to his glory. Ah, but the spiritual virus is still in us. The natural tendency to rebel against God, to ignore the call of Jesus, to close our ears to God's spirit. Temptations will continue to be a part of our lives until Christ comes again. But do not fear. Christ has overcome the world and its powerful bearers of evil. Do not fear. You are forgiven in Christ and made new. So as you live in this wonderful new life by the grace of God in Christ, and as you face temptations and regrettably, painfully, fall into sin. Grow in the loving care of your Creator and Redeemer, in remembering and living out His Word to you as He, by your Spirit, fills and leads you. In part, remember where you are. If only Adam and Eve had remembered where they were in this Garden of Eden. But we're in a fallen world, living among a people who want to form their own Garden of Eden apart from God, who deny any personal, spiritual foundation of life, God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Remember that we are a unique people in the midst of this culture, a culture that blesses us and everyone in so many ways, but also is not shaped by the Word of God. For example, in many ways, the West is a culture that thrives best when God's word is ignored. Capitalism, for example, and the market economy do best when we grow in envy and covetousness for what others have and we don't. Every store window and every visual advertisement is intended to make you and me discontent with what we have or don't have. 
You could say that a lot of advertising is the devil's apprentice. Remember where you are in this world, but also remember where you are in God's church, God's holy nation, God's community living by the way of Jesus, learning how to grow in that together. Hold tight to the church and grow together, encouraging one another, praying for one another in this loving community that is learning to live the way of the kingdom by Christ's work in us. It's why, by the way, in church we regularly confess our sins, admitting our failings, receiving God's grace. It's why we gather in small groups to help love and encourage one another. We can't do this alone. We were made to be in community. And it's why in the best of times we gather to receive the Lord's Supper to hear the forgiving love of God in Christ and the new life of the Spirit poured within us. But don't only remember where you are, remember who you are. If only Adam and Eve had remembered that. You are a person created in the image of God, saved by Jesus Christ, and blessed with the fullness of the Spirit. You are a person made new in Christ and becoming the person who is that newness. Uh, you know this example, but perhaps it'll be for you a, a reminder in a different way for your life how you could do this. Uh, when I was a, a young adult and attracted to uh, women in a way that young men are, I, uh, I struggled with that and as many of you know, came up with a song that I sang so often that I remember to this very day. It reminded me who I am in God and who the others were in him too. I can't sing well because of my voice these days, but it went something like this. She is a child of the king, a work of his creation, made in his image the glory of his hand. O oh Lord, help me see that your handiwork is she. Help me to know that she's your woman, I'm your man. It was for me a continual reminder of who I am in Christ, of who she and others are in God. Uh, perhaps you need to come up with your own song for your own challenges in life. And by the way, I'd like to hear them. But remember not only where you live in this society and in the church. Remember who you are and finally remember whose you are. You belong to God your Father, creator and redeemer. By his grace, God has given his word to lead us. By his love, he has given us his son, Jesus Christ, who has died for us and is now risen over all and is our Lord and Savior. He remains with us forever till the end of the age. And Father and Son have poured the Spirit into our lives so we grow through God's Word to be a new people for His glory. Ah, we said in the beginning that COVID has had a powerful destructive effect on the world and on society. We pray for a vaccine. Thanks be to God who has given this gift to us against the sin of Adam and Eve, against the fall of our humanity in rebellion against God. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, who makes us new people in him and sends us out to proclaim God's glory and beauty and goodness in this new creation. May you grow to live that more and more with me and the whole church around the world for the sake of all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. All praise and glory, honor and thanksgiving belongs to you, Lord God. For the beauty of your creation and the stunning beauty of your new creation in Jesus Christ. Make us more and more aware of where we live, of who we are, and of whose we are, and then let us live joyfully, adventurously, daringly, beautifully, to your glory, to our joy, and the blessings of people all around. In your name we pray, amen.
Regularly when we worship together, we will spend time in honest reflection, in prayers of confession before God, acknowledging the ways that we miss the mark, the ways that we do not live up to the call that God has on our lives, the ways that we do not live into the grace that's been so freely given in love to us through Jesus Christ. And we do so with the cross in mind again this morning. Hear these words from the book of Romans and Hebrews, which say, the proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Trusting in God's faithfulness, and God's compassion. 
Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Will you pray with me? Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. My sisters and brothers, hear this good news. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin, we might live for righteousness and by his wounds, you have been healed. Believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and are being made whole. Amen.
as you go out in this week, or as you stay at home, as the case may be, receive this gift of God. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you. From God your Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit who is among and within us all, and all God's people say, Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.